how many hours of your life will be wasted because of the possible impeachment of Donald Trump? How many hours of your life have already been wasted? Our first reading is very clear about those who are complacent, those who lie on couches, those who sit in their beds and are consumed with the things of the world which are meaningless. How many Americans will spend countless hours sitting on their couches, wasting their time over something which they have no control over and which will ultimately make no dramatic impact in their life? Woe to the complacent. 24-hour news, I truly believe, is an instrument and tool of the devil to numb us, consume us, and to keep us from what we truly are supposed to be doing. How many husbands and how many wives will watch hours of Trump media and never talk to each other, not play with their children, not go for a walk. How many families will be consumed with 24-hour news coverage and yet not go and visit their neighbor, not go to mass this morning, not pray a daily rosary, not spend an hour in front of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, but will spend an hour in front of the tabernacle of Satan. Woe to the complacent. I made a vow that I will watch none of it. Now, I don't have a television, so that makes it a little easier. <laughs> but is talk radio any different when we're in our cars? Is it not better for me to pray a rosary, or to listen to Catholic radio, or to listen to Christian music, or to just sit in silence, than to be consumed with the things of this world? Woe to the complacent. Our gospel passage gives this beautiful il illustration, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Now, just for clarification, Lazarus in this passage is not the same Lazarus who rises from the dead, the relative of Martha and Mary. It's just a common name. But it's very interesting if we look deeply into this passage. First of all, notice that the rich man does not get a name. Because although he thought great of himself here on earth, after his death, no one cared because he loved no one. There was no one to remember his kindness, his compassion, nor his love. His life was all about himself and about him getting what he wanted, when he wanted it, and how he wanted it. So much sore that he became so complacent that he couldn't even see a poor man who had the name of Lazarus who laid at his front porch. How do we know that he was a demanding man and a commanding man, a narcissistic man, a manipulative man, a needy man? Because even when he is in hell, he is still trying to control and demand and ask for what he wants. Notice how he has no name, yet he knows the name of the man who laid outside of his house with sores starving to death. He knows the name of the guy who laid outside his house because from hell he tries to get God to command him to serve him. Father Abraham, tell Lazarus, who did nothing ever offensive to me, and yet I never did anything for him. I never once gave him food for my table. But Father, command Lazarus to serve me in hell.
Lazarus, of course, is resting in the glory of heaven. While the rich man rots and burns in the fires of hell. Because he did not see, he did not recognize the presence of God hidden in the disguise of the poor. He was complacent. And in fact, dogs were able to recognize the suffering of Lazarus more than this man. We celebrate uh, this upcoming Friday the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. Today at 1 o'clock, I will be blessing all of the pets in honor of St. Francis of Assisi. All of your pets you can bring to the St. Paul campus will be blessing them there. Uh, it is one of the happiest days of my life. <laughs> because it only happens one day a year. But it's very, very interesting in this passage. The dogs recognize the suffering of Lazarus, and they come and lick his wounds. Animals are a great blessing to a many a people. They're also a great shame to many of us. Go downtown Cincinnati right now, and I guarantee you that many of the poor and the homeless downtown Cincinnati will have a dog with them. Why? Because the dogs give them more respect and more love than we do. Spend a day visiting the sick, the shut-in, and their houses are filled with cats and dogs, because at least they will recognize them when we do not. My dear brothers and sisters, we are called to have our eyes opened to not be complacent, but to recognize the presence of God in those who suffer, in those who live on the fringes, and even those who live in our own homes. Two weeks ago, the Pregnancy Care Center of Southeastern Indiana had as their keynote speaker at their annual fundraiser, Abby Johnson. Abby worked for eight years as a director of Planned Parenthood. On seeing an ultrasound abortion, she converted instantaneously on the spot to the pro-life cause and has since then converted to be a very convicted Roman Catholic. In her presentation that she gave at the fundraising dinner, she in a certain sense mocked many pious Catholics who every single day ask God to end abortion. In a certain sense, she equated them to the rich man who demands things of God. God, end abortion. God, bring an end to Planned Parenthood. Abby Johnson and her witty humor was just kind of like, do you not know that God hates abortion? You don't need to convince God to end abortion. You have to convince God to hate killing. He does. But what he also hates is the fact that you're doing nothing about it, but just telling me, God, to hate it. And then Abby Johnson offered a prayer for all of us to say. She said this, that our prayer should be as follows. God, break our hearts with what breaks yours. God, break our hearts with what breaks yours. What breaks God's heart? The slaughter of one-third of every conceived child in the United States of America. What breaks God's heart? Abortion. What breaks God heart? God's heart? Hunger, poverty, homelessness. What breaks God's heart? The sick, the elderly, sitting in their homes by themselves with no one visiting them. 
What breaks God's heart? Sexual abuse, physical abuse. What breaks God's heart? Pornography. What breaks God's heart? People who in our world that are unbaptized, that do not know him, and yet Christians who do nothing about it to share the gospel message with them. What breaks God's heart? That young men and young women are being called to be priests and religious sisters, and yet they're so consumed with technology in the world that they don't answer the call. What breaks God's heart? Our complacency. Dear God, break our hearts with what breaks yours. Dear God, help us to not be like the rich man, complacent and consumed with the things of this world, things that do not matter, while the things that do matter are at our very feet. My brothers and sisters, if you read then St. Paul's letter to Timothy, our second reading today, it then makes sense. The urgency that St. Paul has today is profound. Listen to these words he says. Pursue righteousness. Compete for the faith. Lay hold. Take charge. Paul is sending us out on a mission. A mission to do what? To have our hearts broken with what breaks God's heart. To have our hearts broken so much that we'll actually do something with God's grace with faith to change the world. On the day of our judgment, my brothers and sisters, it is our hope that we do not end up in hell. And to do so, we need the brokenness of God's heart in our heart. So I ask you to right now, just close your eyes and I ask of you to pray with me. Please repeat after me. Dear God, break my heart with what breaks yours. Dear God, break my heart with what breaks yours. Give me the grace to have my eyes open to see brokenness brokenness. and to bring healing. healing. Dear God, God, break our hearts hearts with what breaks yours. yours. Amen.